and welcome to the This yeah. Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, mate, pleasure to have you here. Thanks very How much. You doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Perfect, yeah, welcome to uh, our humble abode. No, it's um, lovely, it's yeah. lovely. It's like like you just said off camera, it's a uh, beautiful oasis away from the Cosette, away from the Palais, away from the commotion of yeah. everything that goes on in Cannes. And I'm very pleased to hear, you know, you guys be here for the first time. The amount of creators that are here versus years gone by is, yeah. is hugely inflated. And not just like the superstars who like, Snapchat or YouTube have brought because they want to be seen to have David Dobrik here or whatever. Mm. Um, like, there's a lot of I don't want to call them mid level, but people who have uh, who have strong followings within their own niche rather than just like these superstar influencers. Yeah, people have got a million followers are here. They're either with a brand or they've been brought by an agency or they're coming they're here to do even panels on their own accord as well. And then there's some yeah. people that come on their own accord because they yeah. realise that this is the central of yeah. yeah the advertising universe and this is a good time to be seen in front of everyone. Yeah. That, but that's a really great sign of of how the influence marketing industry is is evolving as well as we're really hitting mass market now. Like yeah. the last few, you, you'll you'll be able to speak. To, it explains why consolidation is happening. Go WPP for instance as as an example. Yeah, I think it's going to be a big theme. Um, yeah. In general, to be honest, and I don't just mean network agencies buying buying um, influencer agencies. I think just consolidation as a as a as a term and as a way to look at the industry over the next couple of years is going to be really really important yeah also from a brand to agency perspective i think there's been so much discovery in the influencer marketing world by brands and they've tried every agency and they've done different things with different agencies they've maybe used their creative agency for bits their media agency for bits specialists for bits yeah and now they're kind of like the understanding is there from yeah. uh, a channel perspective that they can go, okay, now it's time to consolidate down to one or two agencies globally to actually deliver the work like they did with media 25, 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're in that point now. And when consolidation starts from brands, then consolidation has to start from agency networks, right? And, and we were, you know, arguably the first domino to fall. Um, and, and I expect more more to fall over the course of the next couple of years. And I think that's really, really exciting for the, for the, for the, was noticing that this is happening one of the key drivers as to why you decided to partner with WPP? Or? Yeah, consolidation is, is definitely one of two major reasons that we decided to, to go with um, the timing of the acquisition, but also WPP as, as the partner. Yeah. Um, we, we know they're the biggest advertising group in the world, right? Mm. So in terms of access, scale, yeah. global reach, reputation, um, mm. talent, like, you're looking at number one, which yeah, is yeah. amazing. And as the first domino to fall, it's good it, from an ego perspective. And, and we're not massive, massively uh, in chasing anything at any one point. People think the opposite because we've got a cameraman who follows us around. But like, yeah. we, we, we're not those guys. Um, and we've never really shouted us about ourselves other than the vlogs. Um, but it's nice to know that the first domino to fall goes to the biggest fish. Mm. Um, and it's also very exciting because those guys at, Group M and WPP have been very welcoming in the fact that they know we're the disruptor and they know that we want to come in and change the culture at Group M. Yeah. And we want to make them think in a different way and they want to own that opportunity. I'd love, to, I'd love for you to break that down a little bit. When you say you want to own the culture, they want you to do that. How do you define They don't culture? want us to just be another Group M business. They want us to be go inside Group M. And you've um, swallowed up Inca, for instance, as part of yeah, that. So Inca yeah, so Inca will, will now be seen as GOAT uh, globally, which is great. And it adds to our team, yeah, adds to our global. Congrats on that. That's yeah. amazing. Thanks. Yeah, adds to our global footprint. We go from 200 people at acquisition to now 400. Yeah. Um, and it's a great, Inca's a great business. Loads of super talented people across the world. Um, and yeah, it's just a, another huge opportunity for us to, to continue to push yeah. forward and offer something different to brands maybe than what everyone else can because we genuinely are global. Yeah. Like we're in, we've got people on the ground in South Africa and the Nordics and Eastern Europe and obviously the UK, US, Latin America, full, like fully across APAC. We've got like hundred people in APAC. Like it's, we're That's operating incredible. at a proper scale now and there's some properly scaled up solutions. Yeah. Um, in, in general, in the influence marketing world, yeah. that they weren't a few years ago. You know, you've got a few other agencies that are multi hundreds, you... but there's lots of them out of the states. 
having sort of done measurement for a, a whole host of different agencies, there, there are definitely traits within Goat that I've noticed are different. You guys operate very fast. Yeah. Is that is that key to your culture, or how would you like? Are there like pillars with your culture or that you guys define? Yeah, it? I, I think um, fail fast is 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 big. Yeah. Um, we, I don't, I don't know, and I and I don't know enough about lots of the other founders, but. For us, we're genuine entrepreneurs. Like we didn't come into influencer marketing because we loved influencer marketing. That was not our position. Like our mm. position was huge opportunity. This is the time to make the most of it. We think this is the gamble. This is the bet we're going to make. Like that. Um, yeah. And if that bet was selling potatoes in uh, <laughs> Spain, we'd have done that. Yeah. Like we are entrepreneurs. How did it work in the early days? Were what, you selling ex- potatoes in Spain? No, no, yeah. <laughs> uh, were you executing campaigns yourself? Yeah, you? absolutely. Um, right. And, you know, I, I've grown up on social. Uh, I started a, another business and kind of like social 1.0, I suppose, and, um, and exited to that. So like we, we get we get it, but we've kind of learned as we've as we've gone, as we've scaled the business. We've never run an agency before. We still profess to not be agency people. Right. And that kind of move fast thing is just not an agency dynamic. Like loads of the, and, and, and we're learning that, right? At WPP, we're learning that things take time in a, in a big scaled up, multinational um publicly listed business is different yeah but we're trying to keep our culture inside of that because we know it's important for us to keep growing and we also know we're at the precipice of something way way bigger an influencer agency right now is seen as big when it has 400 staff mm. but like we're in a group now where 400 staff is a department yeah. Of an agency. Over 100,000. In a country. I've noticed like, it's it, not yeah, It's yeah. not like a department in Global yeah. It's a department in Poland. Yeah. Like, it's, 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 it's mind blowing the scale. Yeah. So, until we're 5,000 people, we're not even on the radar of all these other big agencies. So, yeah. the scale isn't even close to what we believe and why we believe WPP were the right partner because scale and in terms of the race to scale is going to be the next big thing. First thing was about race to be able to deliver and win the brands and, and, and force the brands to understand that they need to spend money on influencer marketing because it was a huge yeah. ROI positive channel. Mm. I think it's very clear and we're in can and we can see it. Influence has taken over. Creator is a big thing. It's a theme. That and AI, that's the festival this year, this week. Yeah. yeah. Um, the next race is who's going to scale fast. And why we believe that we should be the first domino to fall is because we're already the first to scale to a level Mm. but the scale we're talking about is hundreds like we need to be talking about thousands of people thousands of people to be able to activate at the same level as we were when we were three what do you think are going to be like the next few milestones to get to that scale i'll say even like five thousand people and how long do you think that'll take i think the first the next big milestone is is probably one or two big brands spending 50 million dollars each a year Mm. on 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 influencer um and and has that happened before no I'm, I'm sure there's there's cases where where that that's happening i think for an in and i'm talking about independent rather than like a media agency having a portion of that money so like actually how can a, a, an agency like that us go and win deals like that mm. and and in our history that that deal threshold has moved from five thousand to ten thousand yeah. to twenty five thousand fifty thousand hundred thousand half a mil- million Five million and ten million, and then it's still like the, the the numbers keep going up and up and up. Um, and I think for now, it's probably that fifty million proper yeah, yeah. deal where you're both thinking strategically for them, mm-hmm. you're activating, and you're doing everything across the, the full funnel for a brand. I think that's that's probably the next big step. And then, you know, who who knows where it can go? But I think it's also interesting to see how the other network agencies, the wave makers, mind shares, media comms are how excited the senior teams in those businesses are that we're part of group mm. and that could have been us it could have been anyone else right but some so add more credibility 100 yeah. 100 and, and it's been that was the bit we feared the most as founders you go in and you're maybe you're the hated people because you're the new guys and those people making noise about you and they're forcing you to have conversations with a new agency and why do you care and they're quite small and you know for, for us that's the bit that's probably shocked us the most about how welcoming and nice and excited and willing to push us into opportunities that senior senior people in the WPP network globally are how 
how have the conversation shifted? So I'd imagine with that, you'd, at the very beginning, you'd be trying to convince one of the account directors and it moves into all the way up to like the CMO level. But imagine at this point, you, it, perhaps already for the last few years, you've been discussing more so with like, the likes of the CFOs, trying to allocate yeah. the spend across all the different channels. And I mean, if you're investing 50 million, that's a very significant portion of the uh, market. But it is isn't. isn't. Like we're talking about brands that are spending twenty Billions. billion. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, we're talking to a brand yesterday, um, and my pitch to him was very simple: give me one percent of your budget. One percent. Yeah. Like it's so obvious Drop that influencer should. marketing should take up one percent of your budget. Like oh, I don't need to make that much of a case to yeah. to ask for one percent. Like, I'm, like take 0.2% out of TV, 0.2% out of programmatic. Like, that's all I need. Yeah. And you're giving me $50 million. Like these are, that's the scale we're talking about. We, the influencer marketing business on what? the whole at the moment has been taking so insignificant chunks out of these big budgets. Like people get really excited around big RFP wins and so do we. It's a million dollars. It's like, like it is irrelevant. Like, yeah. if we actually want to make a change in this industry and grow the business and scale, those those budgets have to be more significant and they have to be able to move the dial because, and when we come back to measurement, like, how can we measure the mm. 200 grand campaign versus the $50 million TV ad? Mm. Like, yeah. like, it's, it's, we're trying as best we can to go apples and apples with the metrics, and things, but like, the scale needs to be the same. Mm. Um, or at least we need a fair shot at it. And I think the CMO is starting to realize, and even CFOs, starting to realize they have uh, improportionately allocated budget in marketing for probably five years now. And they're really starting. And things like this week push them to make decisions that maybe they should be braver. And that was a word that I used on a panel yesterday, and it kind of got a lot of people to go, <gasps> What you trying to say? It's like, yeah. like we, we've spent nine years telling people that they should spend on influencer marketing and now we're at can, like, and now it's a big thing. Yeah. Like, what have you been doing? Like, this yeah. is like, it's been so obvious, it's been in your face for years. Like, why is it still a, why is it still a big decision that you should give me 1% of your budget? Why is that a big what, decision? What was the response to the pitch? Yeah, you it was very, I like, I, 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 he, he got it, got yeah. it. Like, he, I think people don't think about it like that and how, they don't think about how insignificant the budget change could be their side for how much significant upside they could get. Absolutely. Um, because they're so shielded by the safety, the safe option, which is why bravery is my key word this year, this week, because people shouldn't be spending money on TikTok now. They should. But what I mean is they should have spent it four years ago when it was called Musical.ly, because that was oh. the opportunity. That was the bravery. That was the time where people should have gone. Because proportionately, the 50 grand would have worked way harder on Musical.ly than it would on TikTok way harder yeah yeah so be brave try things like taking five years to start talking about tiktok as if it's like this new revolutionary channel that's got billion users like that's not it's not brave yeah you're just a sheep you're just like you it, what you're not genuine marketers you're not trying you're not innovating you're following the crowd and hoping that someone else has made the mistakes for you like the whole I point of marketing is a, making is, is a good word choice there is because where where are the biggest spend? What TV out of home? Yeah, and that's because they've what been doing that for twenty, thirty plus years. And they're never, they, there's a that. really really good phrase in advertising which you'll never get sacked for buying TV ever. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that unfortunately question. is how the world works. People but, want to do something that's safe, keep yeah. their job, their high power, well paid job, and 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 that's important to people, obviously. If we're really looking inside the industry, we should be thinking, what can we do to innovate? What can we do differently? And marketers should be thinking about how they can make their dollars work, work. hardest. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm. It's, it's interesting if you look at the evolution as well, if you've got like some out of home TV, it's you, you're not targeting a specific audience. And then so targeting was like the key word when people were going more to programmatic and so sort of social media and, and that growing. But something that we've really seen with influence marketing is that you've got a whole new thing, which is we sort of think about it more as like distribution. Mm -hmm. They've got their own communities. People are choosing to engage with things. You, you guys use the word peers. Yeah, yeah. 
um, and uh, niche audiences for niche, yeah, uh, niche yeah. content for niche audiences. Yeah. yeah. And finally, we've, we've been able to build ways in which are scalable and repeatable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, we, we see and it I think, no I think what's really important like with, with our relationship and why we've been partners with you guys for 18 plus months, right? I'm, I'm potentially one of your biggest clients and I'm, I'm, I'm biggest advocates um, is because we needed a way and we came to this, came to you guys with this challenge, right? We, we needed a way to try and get these $50 million budgets because mm. we needed a way to go apples and apples. And there was loads of solutions in the market to try and do that, but nothing really felt compelling enough when you took it to a CMO with just a piece of paper, a PDF and go, this is what the measurement says that I could really stand behind the methodology. That was the main thing that we made a decision on as to who our partner was going to be. Your methodology made sense because it it looked at influencer as a genuinely different channel that focus on audiences that engage with the content. Not some random person who's never seen this person before oh, yeah. and has no idea that they have cultural relevance within that market or that audience and they've created content based on it. You guys look at that, which is actually the value. Yeah. Um, now there's still lots of stuff that will develop over the course of the next few years around measurement in, in this market because we're still super early. But that is where lots of other big measurement businesses have missed a trick because yeah. they don't realize that the impression value through influencer when, an, when someone has signed up to follow that person is more valuable than someone being hit by a TV ad randomly. Yeah. And, and trying to level that playing field to create these apples and apples comparisons is is really important for us and it was really really successful when we started rolling it out with with big big clients who started mm. to spend serious money to understand with you guys yeah. um what, right, thank you what, that. That measure, what that measurement looked like but yeah that was that was a really important moment for like our relationship because you got to understand our well, actual problem we, we we really sort of elaborated on the mmm Yes. model trying to map out the roles of each of the different channels yeah and how the the data that's being used for that currently is quite questionable yes it's very much just looking at reach and some number that they've taken to be able to multiply mm -hmm. against that and and i think that stems from the nature in the past where it was just about reach because you would just use out of home you just use tv and you couldn't really specify who's seeing it or but, really how many people saw it i guess yeah i guess so, even so that, it's yeah. a model so in that itself. felt innovative for them at that stage but now we know really deep who we're targeting, not even at the demographic level, but psychographics, values, interests, things that they buy into, fans of yep. literally anything. Mm. There, there's, there's, it is really important that we do that, but that has got our brains sort of thinking and we've got a roadmap where we are gonna start looking to replicate what we're doing across the different channels to be able to identify what role do these different channels play. And as you said, I think that's, that is super important because it influence marketing is absolutely fantastic, but there are times where other channels do play that role and the customer uh, journey has multiple touch points. And that is really, really important for me mm. to, to say. And why I'm only asking for 1% of someone's budget. Because mm. I don't believe that influence marketing should be 80%, yeah. not 100 I don't believe that. Like there is so much to be said for good planning across multiple channels. And all the best campaigns are built across multiple channels. Yeah, top up. Um, and for me, influencer marketing or social, smart social budget should be probably 40% of people's budget and influencers should be 20, like 15, 20% of total budget. Um, and I, I don't want the rest of it because I think that there's value in, in consumers being talked to in different ways by different people using different touch points across different mediums. Like it's, it is valuable. And each one of them has different resonance with, with yeah. the audience. Um, I think the beauty of influencer is you can have loads of people in your audience talk about I think it's, it's the, interesting the brand the, in the same way. The word resonance there, because um, I mean, I mean, I feel like we've even gone leaps and bounds that we don't just talk about awareness and sales campaigns. We've now got awareness, consideration, and conversion campaigns. Yeah, but I feel like that's also missing a big chunk of that sort of mid funnel between these two, mm. anchoring perceptions, but building up familiarity driving relevance that seems to be completely neglected well, we did it with a product right together where we we tried to understand what people thought about vr in general yeah like it wasn't nothing to do with the product it was purely what is your perception of vr exactly um and then we obviously tied that back into the measurement of the campaign which was a vr product 
Um, but really, it was interesting to see what that audience to begin with even thought about VR. What, mm -hmm. what did they think? Did they think it was clunky, old school? Did they think it was uh, years away from being good? Did they think it was the next thing or did they think it was going to be a flop or did they think it was already a flop? Like yeah. the yeah. understanding, the perception of VR before you even start to measure what the audience is uplift is going to be based on the experience with the content or when they go and buy the product is fascinating. And perception measurement is really, really interesting. Yeah. Because there's loads of products that have seeing very how old that perceptions. Shifts over time and what drives those shifts? Is it specific creator verticals? Is it specific types of concepts? I think there's a lot that the industry, we, we, our purpose we see as trying to make marketing enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And something that I somewhat find frustrating is when we think about marketing, we always immediately think about advertising and we very quick to overlook market research. But it's market research that allows us to understand things like relevancy or like perception shifts. It allows us to understand, okay, why influence marketing is so effective. We, we can always turnkey amplify performance. Mm -hmm. But if you've got shit ads, excuse the language, you don't really want to be adding more performance on I that. I agree. Yeah. Performance can always be amplified, effective as can, and be able to understand why one campaign had high sales and high reach when one had high reach but no sales, being able to understand that so you can drive repeatable, scalable success. Super, super key. Yeah, I agree with that. 100%. 100%. If we could, I'd love to wind back the time to like the starting days of Go. Yeah, I'm actually fascinated by this as what well. What was like the genesis conversation that, that you had with Aaron and Nick? And because you, you were all working together before at the Lobster. Sport Lobster. Yeah. Yeah, so we, <clears throat> it's like 2015. We worked together at Sport Lobster um, from 2000, late 2012. Um, I came in as head of social, Nick was head of marketing. Um, but there was like five of us. Aaron was co-founder. And we had an app that needed new users. That was the crux of it. We needed to scale this business to be a billion dollar unicorn exit. That was that yeah. was the dream. Um, and we all thought we were working at Facebook. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, Facebook did really well. <laughs> and we didn't do so well. But what we did learn there was how to acquire users fast. Mm. And we spent money on everything. TV, radio out of home, huge celebrity endorsement, um, classic digital. And what we realized was when we spent 10 pounds with um, one of my mates who had 100,000 followers um, in the Manchester United um, audience, he drove more downloads for his 10 pounds for his 100,000 followers of the app than Cristiano Ronaldo did with his 110 million followers. And we were like, hmm, we've paid Ronaldo a lot more money than we pay this guy. Mm. There's something in this. There's, yeah, yeah. Like, and then we, we scaled that. We were like, okay, let's go and find 100 people who all look like this guy. So it's just like tapping into micro-influencers. And, and I suppose so. they were, at that point, 100,000 was I massive. Think, yeah, macro, yeah, yeah. Massive. Yeah. Um, but it was like, how can we go and find 100 more of that guy? Yeah. 100,000 followers in a football community talking on Twitter Let's go and find all of them mm. and pay them all 10 quid because that's the, the, that was about the going rate. And um, and we did it and we quickly realized the results were not what we thought they were going to be. We thought they were all going to drive 2000 downloads because that's what the first guy had driven. And really, we owe a whole business to that first guy, like Because if we'd have used one of the other guys in that 100 sample size, we would never have started the business because we thought it wouldn't have worked and we would have yeah. gone to the next thing. So, so what was 80, that about like 75, 80 percent of the people that we used, um, like it, they just didn't return the same value as this guy did. Mm -hmm. Twenty percent did, and some with more value, some with you know still incredible hundred thousand dollars, some with three thousand dollars. And we're like, okay, what's what's the relationship between someone who's good and someone who's bad? Yeah, and it was impossible to say. That was the crux of it. It was impossible. They had the same number of followers the same engagement rate, like they were talking about the same shit, but there was something intangible that made that person influential in the community when they said something and that person not. And that was it. That was the beginning of us realizing that actually what's valuable in this business is the data. 
Yeah. It's understanding who works and who doesn't. That's it. That's all that matters because you cannot tell with the publicly facing metrics who's good and who's not. And that's our business. We we have all the data on everyone we've ever used, all the performance, all the cost per view, cost per engagement, cost per impression, cost per sale, cost per download of what did those people drive? And we've done like tens of thousands mm. and understanding who works and who doesn't allows us to guarantee results and people, Aaron, Nick and I are not agency people. And we looked at the agency model and we were like, well, why are you incentivized to not succeed? Um, you know, you, you, you pay people on time normally, um, or like very poor deliverable metrics that aren't really what the performance of the brand that they need. So we're like, okay, well, we'll just guarantee the numbers, uh, and you know what you're going to buy before you bought it from us and then we'll deliver it. How, um, how did that land guaranteeing performance? Cause that, that was, you just didn't believe us. Yeah. 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 Um, which is a great position to be in because if you've got a product that's too good, like almost too good to be true. And then it's true. It's like, oh my God, that's how word of mouth works. Right. Yeah. If, yeah. if you look back on any product in the history of time, they're all too good to be true. And then they deliver on their promise. That's yeah. what a great product is. At what point in this journey did you start doing the daily vlog? That was like 2019. We basically not talked about ourselves at all online. Yeah. Um, you couldn't find anything about us. How big was the, the team at that point and where were you at? How big so was the team? Like 80 when you started? 60? Yeah, I'd say 80. Yeah, 80. 80 yeah. So like big. Um, and we were in our big office in Finsbury Square. Like we, like we were paying a couple of million quid a year in our office. Like we were by far the most scaled up version okay. of an influencer at that point. Another agency was like 15, 20 people. Are yeah. we being naive then? Because we, we're coming on about 30 people and we want to start doing a daily vlog. Should we yeah, focus I think it's a good. other things first? No, and then everyone should create content. We, yeah. we started too late. Um, yeah. I wish we had started earlier. We had so many conversations around starting earlier and we just never did it um, because we were scared. And, and that comes back to my word of the week, right? Bravery. Bravery, Bravery yeah. and innovation drives yeah. actual results. And if you're the first to do it, then you, you drive a huge amount of results and you make your dollars work hard. Um, and it's exactly the same with the daily vlog. We were the first to really, really do it outside of Gary B, um, who obviously does it incredibly well. And we, we took it with a different slight. We said, okay, well, Gary's got this thing where you just want to watch him, mm. but that means also brands only want to buy him. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to film everyone from the mm. intern through the door on the first day through to Aaron and I sitting in our office with Nick on the phone from New York. We're going to be the agency soap opera. We're going to be that. every day and you're going to watch us and it's going to be big brother for agencies and you're going to get to know everybody and you'll have your favorite characters and you'll fucking skip through some bits of, with the character you don't like. And like, it was just there every day. And we had, by the end of it, we had like, brands who want to work with certain account managers because they'd watched that person for 50 episodes awesome. and they loved them. That's amazing. And and those personalities drive business. People forget agency world is people. Relationships. 100%. And, yeah. and that's kind of become a bit of a dirty word. Like people don't like the idea that agencies are built on relationships and whining and dining and making it fun for someone to come and spend money with you because ultimately they need to spend time with you as well and, mm -hmm. and get on. And we just kind of reverse that by going, okay, well, it's quite difficult to take loads and loads of people out for dinner and go and do events. And it's also quite expensive. So what we'll do is we'll make our, what we know are good personalities within the business publicly facing. We're not going to worry. Everyone goes like, oh, are you worried that that really good person is going to get hired by someone else? We'll go, no, because they're not going to film them every week and make their profile really big. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> like, unless they do that, we're, we're the guys. Um, yeah, and we, we genuinely, a family, doesn't 100%. It? Yeah. And, and it's really nice for people to also be able to show their family and friends and their people will look at them and go, oh, that's actually a really good, fun place to work. And it, and it, and it is like, we want people to enjoy their job. It's exactly what you said. Marketing needs to be fun. This is not brain surgery. Mm, Nothing yeah. matters at all. They have a really strong mission and we really want to be a part of that. And that's as awesome. founders, build genuine legacy. Mm. I think lots of people will look up, look 
look at it from the outside and go, oh, you guys sold for a lot of money. It was obviously fully financially like uh, motivated. We were very, very fortunate the two years before we did the private equity deal. And yeah. as founders, we were um, significantly compensated to the point where financial was never really an incentive for us in the WPP deal at all. Mm. Now, obviously, when you build a business with value, you want, you want to get your value out. But that was never a factor. We never and we never negotiated on price at all mm. um, because that was never the factor. It was all about what value can we bring together and what are we actually trying to build? What's this actually going to be in five years time? What, mm. and, and what one of the major things, and, and they never questioned it, and they, I think they even put it forward, but GOAT had to be the name. Legacy wise, that had to be the name. We couldn't go into Inca. Like, from, from our perspective, legacy yeah. and what we're trying to achieve. Bring that culture into has it. To be, has to be GOAT. And they wanted yeah. that. Right? And that's why we also like them as a partner because we're like, they get it. They understand why they need to change and why they need to see this market as something totally different and to be treated differently, different attitude. Did it change the the, the, the culture of the company itself? Because you're not having a PE partner, I'd imagine you'd be way more margin driven or no, didn't being as entrepreneurs really have that. Me, we are margin driven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, so we are set true salespeople. We care mm. about doing the deal and making the money. Um, mm. And we have amazing people in the business that drive creativity and they drive performance and they drive big thinking. But our job as a three is to drive the revenue and the profit. Well, that's and build clearly shown its success. Mm. You've moved so fast, and, and yeah, it's been it's been a, it, look, yeah. it's been mad, uh, and I'm incredibly fortunate, and we are, we're very lucky that we're surrounded with amazing people, and um, the industry is full of young, exciting founders, and you guys are very much in that group, who mm -hmm. are going to make a lot of money in this this industry because this is a big this is a this is a big opportunity. Now you need to do the right things, and the, the businesses need to grow, but uh, what we always said to each other as a three probably after like year two when we realized okay this is going to be it's going to be bigger than we probably ever thought it was and we were like we're never going to have an opportunity like this ever again yeah we should. doesn't matter how doesn't matter how good the the next idea is like the idea is going to have to massively over index the opportunity because this opportunity is like gargantuan now you have to have a i think you can have an okay idea in this opportunity and make a load of money mm, mm. i think you on the whole you have to massively over index the idea versus the opportunity and in influencer over the last five years you can under index the idea because the opportunity is so great we in 2019 went through an accelerator program in berlin and they really instilled in us this concept of product market fit mm -hmm. i think the easiest way to describe that is you've got product market fit if you have a terrible product but people still use it because the pain is so exactly. so big and that kind of just rang bell as you were saying that's that. just influencer right now right and, yeah. and group m great example huge pain Every, all brands are asking for influencer zero way to activate need something by mm. go mm. yeah that's that's yes. product market fit um now in four years time when there's other agents other agency networks looking to buy a platform maybe they won't have as good a they, they can't make the decision based on the best in the market anymore um, and therefore those decisions are clouded, right? But right now there's still, I believe, a handful of really good influencer businesses that all the network agencies are going by. Do you, do you feel really confident in the growth of, because there's projections of 30% year on year all the way through to 2030. Hmm. Do, you, do you feel confident in that growth and, and what do you think is gonna drive that growth? Uh, it's, 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 what's gonna drive that growth is that 1% model that I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. It's like people just realizing, oh, you don't really need to, even increase our budget that much like mm -hmm. it's just it's just a percentage on the like, if you bake in one percent in your budget before you start filling out everything else then how you realize so, you won't actually change anything else really how much of a role do you think measurement or insight solutions are going to play in that in that I, journey i think like like we discussed earlier the ability for us to like for like compare channels is going to be absolutely critical to the next yeah. wave of this in the next two or three years yeah as people try and make and justify those percentage increases on this this channel line yeah. in their budget and from it going from a brand marketer's decision to now a cfo's decision because the budget is so much larger mm. uh, justification measurement and proof is going to be absolutely critical and, and that's where you guys fit it's amazing it's really exciting 
we I remember when we kind of had that first feeling of this is the direction we're going to go. Dom said to me, let's work like no one ever would for five years so we can spend the rest of our life like no one ever can. Yeah. Yeah. Those five years have passed. But you're on a boat and can. I mean, what more can you want? Yeah, actually, fair, I, I put an Instagram story up yesterday. Um, Rowdy's really cleverly put together like a fly reel of all the stuff we've been up to in the first 24 hours. Yeah, I saw that. It's great. Um, and it was a pinch me moment. Like, uh, we are on a boat in can. We are talking to the hottest news story of the year right. in influence marketing. I, uh, are... I cried for the first time in two years telling my dad last week that we we're going to come here. Uh, and just like other things that have been happening, it's just... It it's cool, mate. Like it's, it's this, is, this is the center of the universe for and seven it, days it, in our universe. It all started in my basement flat in Berlin. Oh, sorry, in, in, uh, in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Uh, we worked out of a laundry room in the flat. Nice. Um, we had a sofa and a whiteboard and sketches of all the, the ideas for the platform. Um, he says sofa, like you, you could barely <laughs> yeah, even stand yeah. in the room. You had to sort of shuffle past it to get to uh, the wall. But... Um, that's a great startup story. Yeah, it really was like the like equivalent to the Steve Jobs working out the garage kind of idea. Um, but no, it's, it's incredible. And um, I think we've got a positive future. And I'm really grateful that we have had the chance to work with companies like yours. Um, it's a massive validation. It's exciting. Um, and it gives us so much, I think, confidence going forward that, um, yeah, we can continue on the, on the road that we've been going on. Are you going to smash it? Dude, Thank you, man. It's been a real honor. Yeah, thank, you, so thank you very much. Appreciate the conversation. Thanks, mate. Yeah, that was good. Perfect.